countries the challenges are international trade and, and migration, and you can also see from, from the title. And uh, if you see at, at his web page, uh, he has recently published in Regional Science and Human Economics, in the Journal of Development and Migration, and also the Review of Economics of the Household. He is working in several projects involving analysis of migration, remittances, and in several cases where uh, his, his research is based on the analysis of, of, of regions. Okay, so that's why it was important for, for us to have him here. So thank you very much for attending the invitation. Thank you also to, to the co-authors, to Federico and, and Rama, who have uh, already joined or will do it soon. And in terms of the uh, working of the seminar, let me kind of ask you to, to turn your microphones off and to formulate all your questions uh, through the chat. Okay, as far as we have co-authors uh, already connected, they can try to answer uh, questions that you formulate through the chat. And in case there is some relevant issue that we need to discuss, we can also, as you said, to, to stop and clarify. But I think that it would be much better to keep questions to the end. Okay, so uh, before we, uh, I, I give the, the floor to, to Giuseppe, let me also uh, inform you that the seminar is being recorded. So if any of you uh, doesn't want to appear in the recording, just uh, switch off your camera. And remember that messages that are sent to the chat will also be recorded. Okay, so thank you very much again to everybody. And I give the floor to Giuseppe to present the paper Migration and Trade during the Belle Epoque in Argentina, 1870-1950. Okay, so thank you again, Giuseppe, when you want. Okay, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, uh, as Raul said, well, thank you for inviting me. I was supposed to be in Barcelona during these days, but things have changed quite, quite, a, quite some. Um, and the work I'm presenting today is a joint work with uh, uh, Rama Dazi Mariani. Uh, she's in our department. She's teaching here, and she's also at uh, Tor Vergata. And Federico Nastasi, who is a, 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 doc, a doctoral student here. Rama, Rama is a postdoc, formerly here and now at uh, Tor Vergat. Um, so um, let me tell you first the motivation of this, uh, of this work. Um, so basically, the, the main uh, research question that we have is the one that you see here. So basically, it's the well-known question regarding the relationship between performances in trade of one country and uh, uh, migration, uh, basically in migration, so migration in, uh, and the performances of these countries. So basically, this is our, our uh, initial question. And then uh, we have moved on and we have tried to uh, participate to the debate which, tell, which is this still discussing whether uh, migration can help more imports or more exports. There are different channels that uh, um, can characterize how migration can help uh, imports or exports. And I will give you a, a short overview uh, in the literature and what, what are those for everybody who is not familiar with this? Uh, so, um, but the, the title includes Argentina and it includes Argentina in a very peculiar period. It's the, the, the period 1870-1913, basically the first, uh, what, what is famous for to be the, um, the first uh, globalization and together with the period of mass migration. Um, so, uh, history, we thought, in this case, could help because during that period, the mass migrations could give us uh, more um, evidence, uh, at least uh, much uh, stronger and intensive flows during that period, especially for the, for the countries that are in the New World uh, and especially the, the Argentina in this case. So our focus is, as I said, on Argentina um, during this uh, uh, over 40 year period. Uh, and uh, it's the relationship between Argentina and eight uh, uh, European countries' economies in some ways that are listed, listed here. Uh, we use bilateral data for 
trade and bilateral data for migration. Uh, let me be more precise, bilateral in this case, uh, I mean, the migration flows were mainly from Europe to Argentina and not the other way around. So by bilateral, I simply mean that uh, we have numbers for uh, migrants uh, leaving one of, those one of those eight countries and getting to Argentina. Uh, what are our main contributions to um, the literature here? Uh, as I said, I mean, trying to contribute to the debate on how and how much migration can help exports and imports. Um, the contribution can be, uh, I think, also appreciated by economic historians since uh, uh, we try to, to, to give numbers, basically to do a sort of cliometric uh, uh, work uh, on uh, the quantitative effect of migration on uh, the Argentine economy. Uh, consider that uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, regarding the effect of migration on the Argentine trade and Argentine performances, but very, very few studies that uh, tackle the question from a, a, an econometric and a, an empirical point of view with data. Uh, and then the other contribution, I think, is that the proposal that we give uh, in terms of the instrumental variable uh, that we consider here. Um, uh, basically, we want, we, with the proposal that uh, uh, we give for the instrumental variable, I don't want to ruin uh, the surprise. We'll, we'll see you later what this uh, instrumental variable uh, we have chosen is for. Um, it, it's able to isolate all the push factors of migration out of those eight uh, European countries that you have seen listed here. So uh, the outline of my presentation is the following. Uh, I will briefly tell you, uh, especially for the people who are not familiar with this literature, uh, what are um, the, the debates to, to which we want to contribute to um, and the, the two strands of literature that I told you. Then I will move to give you a, a, a brief historical background on Argentina, what was Argentina during those years and uh, the years before. Uh, well, you are from Spain, probably um, some of you or most of you know uh, some uh, of the, of the uh, facts that I'm going to recall here, uh, but uh, maybe it, it's useful for some others. Uh, the extraordinary period that characterized Argentina uh, during those years. I will move to then to the data, the empirical model, uh, which, uh, which is basically an augmented gravity model where we included migration as a way to uh, decrease uh, uh, transactions costs and uh, bilateral uh, trade costs. Um, and then to the identification strategy results and uh, um, also some robustness checks that we tried so far. Um, you will see, I mean, some of the results are pretty stable. Um, some others, uh, we got them like two days ago. So to have a debate and to have a, a, some uh, feedback from, from the audience here um, would be great. Okay, so let me uh, give you an overview of the results first. Uh, well, generally we find the positive contribution of migration on, as we say here, overall trade. So meaning both imports and exports. And I will tell you how, uh, what are the different combinations of imports and exports that we, we try in, um, in our estimation. Uh, but then um, we, highlight the, the, the main result, which is that the main and the most important effect, uh, say the, the effect that uh, uh, basically remains all, all over the different specifications that we try, is the positive effect on, uh, on imports. And just to give you a, a number here, basically a 10% increase in migration uh, has a, a, an incredible, I mean, very high effect on imports, which is up to uh, 8%. Um, now, the results, as, uh, as I said, are pretty much confirmed on all the different uh, robustness checks that we, that we propose here. 
and there is one um, robustness check, one important uh, change that we do with respect to the original and to the standard uh, uh, empirical model, to the standard gravity model that we would like to discuss with you, which is a way uh, to bypass the problem of having just one single country in, in, as uh, exporter and importer, which is Argentina. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, literatures to which we want to contribute, two strands of literature. The first one is uh, the one that, that is much more familiar to economists, and especially to international economists, uh, and it's the, the relationship that started in the mid-90s with uh, the contribution of Gould on the Canadian Journal of uh, uh, Economics, uh, um, where uh, this was the first time, I think, that I recall, uh, where an economist tried to see the effects of migration on uh, the trade performances of one country. Uh, the results is that basically uh, migration can facilitate trade uh, and then many other uh, works, uh, many other papers uh, followed, in particular Jim Rausch from UC, from California, contributed uh, a lot with many papers underlying uh, basically how migration can facilitate exports that you see on the second, on the third bullet point here. Um, because the effects through which migration is able to facilitate trade is uh, uh, for exports via reduction in uh, transactions costs, information costs. Here I refer to the, the, the work by, by Jim Rausch in 1999, but there have been a lot of other, um, uh, other contributions uh, uh, even in the in more, more recent times. Um, imports instead, uh, well, the most important channel here is the preference effect. The fact that you have migrants getting into your country means that they can activate more demand and uh, as we, uh, I will tell you about in the, in the last slide, uh, activating also the demand for what they are called ethnic goods meaning um, that this is going to increase a variety of goods that an economy is going to enjoy. So um, in this case, the, 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 say the, the, the literature on international trade has tried to see the effects of migration, uh, both on imports and exports, but also separating imports and exports. Uh, the second strand of literature is uh, much more related to uh, um, the historical investigation uh, on the role of migration in uh, the development of many South American countries, and in particular in Argentina. Here uh, we mention, actually the last uh, uh, point you can't see in the slide, we mentioned some uh, works uh, that have been produced on uh, basically on Argentina or many other countries in, uh, um, in South America, uh, but most of these evidence is uh, anecdotal. Um, take Ramon Munoz here, uh, basically he underlines the fact that uh, when uh, Italian and Spanish uh, immigrants uh, uh, got to Argentina, they started importing olive oil and wine, uh, which was completely unknown, uh, in the in South America before, um, and also other contributions has, have been listed here. Uh, now um, let me move to give you a little background, um, a, a, a little picture of what Argentina was during the period that we want to analyze here, and especially where Argentina was coming from. Um, now, the process of unification in Argentina uh, took a long time. The independence from Spain was in 1816, but then uh, it, basically it was just in 1862 um, that we can consider the process of reunification uh, concluded. It was the year that also Buenos Aires became the, the, the capital of, uh, of Argentina in this case. Um, What's nice about Argentina during that period is that uh, together with the unification, 
Actually, uh, a very modern constitution was passed. Uh, a modern in the sense that there was a, a, an important affirmation of the rule of law, uh, especially with respect to other uh, Latin American countries here. And the other characteristic of the Argentina, uh, of Argentina in that case, in that uh, particular situation is that, well, uh, during the years, the, the 1870s through, uh, well, all the 1860s, 1870s, and part of the 1880s, uh, there was a, 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 an expansion of the frontier uh, by um, Argentina, similar to what happened in the US, basically in, in the same years, but differently from the US, this was mostly a military expansion. Uh, whereas in the US, we, you had more uh, a civilian expansion, civilian settlers getting uh, the places where um, basically the natives were, were staying there. So this is the picture of the, the, main, the main characteristics. Um, uh, this contributed to an incredible economic boom for Argentina during uh, those uh, 40 years, over 40 years that we analyze here. And here are some of the numbers. Uh, GDP per capita, basically all more than doubled in 40 years, going from a little more than 2,500 US dollars per capita to over 6,500. The share of world GDP of Argentina uh, uh, expanded uh, incredibly. It went from less than 1% to almost 2.5%. And especially, it outpaced many other uh, comparable South American countries. So let me give you a picture. Oh, okay. I give you a picture of a comparison between Argentina, uh, which is the, the black line here, and other uh, comparable countries. Uh, Mexico, uh, here, uh, I don't see because there, I have something here on, on the last line, probably Chile, uh, and Brazil. And you can see how um, during these years, um, um, Argentina basically took over. Now, the US was pretty stable during that time, even though the, 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 the share in the in the world, the trade was, was a lot, much higher than Argentina, but Argentina picked up during this period. Oops, sorry. Oh, I see someone getting in. Sorry. Sorry, Raul, I, I think I have people. Okay. Can I take your time? Okay. Okay, so what's the role of migration in this case? Um, basically, uh, and the, the, uh, the role of migration and trade for this Argentine boom. Um, basically, um, I think uh, most economic historians are uh, agreeing on the fact that um, the economic boom in Argentina was due to two, ma two main uh, characteristics. The first was the rapid increase in economic resources, both land and labor, and the other one was the, the fact that Argentina opened up to trade. So basically a sort of export-led growth. Now, uh, regarding um, endowments increments, um, uh, sorry, Raul, I, I, I keep on uh, hearing um, Something probably there is there are people who are getting there late and I have to allow them. Sorry. Yes, let there's no problem. Yeah. yeah. Let me. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether there is a, a a way to admit everybody, but if you are not in 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 uh, in Rome, uh, that's much more difficult. That's that's why. Okay. So uh, regarding. Um, increasing the endowments in both land and labor. Here are uh, some numbers. Uh, arable land uh, through basically, uh, as we said, uh, military expansion increased by a factor of 54 within 40 years. So you can imagine how this increased the endowment of the economy. 
And at the same time, uh, the dynamics of uh, demography was uh, also um, following up at the same, I mean, was, was, was very active during that period. Um, population in Argentina in 100 years basically uh, became 10 times as much. Uh, it overcame in 1910 uh, over 6 million here, and it started only 600,000 in 1810. Uh, openness to trade. Um, well, why? I've already showed you how Argentina increased um, its share in world uh, GDP and in, in uh, also in um, um, yeah, in trade. Um, now, what's the origin of this boom? Uh, now, Argentina uh, basically specialized in uh, uh, agric in producing agricultural products. So. The specialization model was based on uh, um, agriculture, basically, and this coincided with a period uh, in which there was a, a, an increase on average per capita income in Europe, um, and this, which increased the demand for agricultural products uh, from, from Europe and from all over the world. Uh, now, here I report a, a, a a sentence that uh, probably you as uh, Spaniards, you, you probably know very well. Uh, it's one of the uh, different uh, uh, phrases that you can find regarding Argentina during that period. Argentina was uh, as the breadbasket of the world during that period. Um, now, the share of exports uh, increased uh, uh, here. I'm sorry, but I can't see. Okay. The share of world exports increased, uh, uh, as you see here, up to 4%. Uh, sorry, I, when I'm presenting with the full screen here, uh, what happens is that I have a, a small bar here. Um, um, let me see if I can move it. Okay. Okay. Now, um, what are the main factors playing an important role in uh, uh, Argentine immigration here? Um, well, the first one, um, well, two uh, factors uh, that actually increase the demand for labor and increase wages during that period. The extension of the arable land, as we said, and at the same time, the abolition of slavery in 1853, even though uh, slavery was not that as diffused as in other countries like Brazil. Uh, the second one is uh, the fact that the Argentine government um, realized that actually the demand for labor was very, very high. Uh, and so they uh, encouraged immigration here. The, 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 the policy was pro-immigrants, um, including some subsidies for um, People were leaving uh, Europe, mainly Europe, and getting to Argentina. Um, and also, uh, well, as uh, Spaniards and Italians, we know that pretty well, cultural affinity and language similarity um, contributed a lot on, uh, say, sorting uh, the type of migrants uh, that uh, slowly got there. And let me show you uh, a table which tells you the composition, well, the role of immigrants in, in the economy, in the, in the whole population. Um, as you see here, we started with uh, something like less than 20% in the first decade, and we ended up in the last 13 years, uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, with uh, a, a percentage of the population which was higher than 40%, as you see in the last line of this table. And here I underline also the fact that uh, um, the sorting uh, that I was telling you in terms of um, cultural affinity and language similarity contributed a lot in uh, the composition of migration. Uh, basically, as you see here, at the end of our, of our period, 97% uh, of the immigrants we're talking about flows in this case, uh, were coming from Italy and from Spain. 
Um, okay. Okay, just to finish this uh, presentation, um, let me show you uh, a picture that uh, gives us a, a, an idea of the strong correlation between the two phenomena. The phenomenon of, uh, um, say, uh, openness of the economy, which is represented by the gray line here, um, and uh, uh, the share of foreign-born population that you see in the black line. As you see, the two phenomena are closely related. So we move to uh, our research question. So the research, the research questions that we wanted to raise was exactly those two. So um, uh, what was the quantitative contribution of migration to, to trade um, for Argentina and uh, uh, whether this effect was stronger for exports and imports? So basically, the idea is that uh, both openness to trade and increase in the endowments, meaning also migration, both contributed to uh, the economic boom in Argentina. What we want to see here is how they are interconnected uh, and how these, uh, say, uh, virtuous circle uh, cycle that, that, that was triggered by uh, say the mass migration and the openness and the first globalization were uh, for Argentina here. Um, but of course, uh, and I mentioned that uh, in our previous slide, uh, the problem that we have here, as in all the other papers that treat on uh, uh, the relationship between migration and trade, is the problem of reverse causality. Uh, that I will uh, reprise later on in, uh, in my presentation here. So, um, the, the empirical model that we take in our um, presentation here, that we use in our paper, is the augmented gravity uh, model, augmented by migration. So, here, um, let me show you here. Um, so um, bilateral trade between Argentina and any country I uh, can be distinguished according to the Head and Meyer uh, approach of uh, the structural gravity model. Uh, we have two different uh, specifications depending on whether Argentina is an importer or an exporter. Basically, when Argentina is an importer, the first term represents uh, capabilities of the exporter, I, in this case, to penetrate Argentina with respect to the absorption capacity of Argentina. Uh, but the, this switches around when Argentina is an exporter, of course. Um, now, um, you can recognize here, for the people who are familiar with this model, that why uh, depending, I mean, YI and YA are basically gross uh, uh, production, uh, whereas the XA and XI uh, represents absorption in the economy, uh, meaning basically uh, total expenditure in the country here. Yeah. Uh, the omega and the fees are representing the multilateral resistance terms, uh, and then um, instead the fees are bilateral resistance terms here. And what we want, I mean, typically in uh, um, the specification, especially the original specification of the uh, gravity model, the bilateral resistance term was represented simply by distance between the two countries. Uh, so we call this a, an augmented uh, gravity model uh, by basically including migration into uh, the bilateral resistance term. <clears throat> of course, I mean, distance will contribute positively to the resistance term. Migration should have a negative effect, okay? Uh, now, let me point you um, to um, an important problem that we have here in this specification uh, because uh, here, differently from the typical estimations of a gravity equation, 
we only have one country on which we are pivoting our uh, estimation, which is Argentina. Indeed, Argentina sometimes is an importer, sometimes is an exporter. And this has an important uh, um, cost with respect to our estimation, which is highlighted here in red. Basically, as you see here, um, the um, multilateral resistance term, in this case, it will much more be difficult to uncover through uh, the usual way, say the structural, the non-structural way uh, of uncovering the multilateral resistance term. So when, when Argentina is an importer, it's easy to obtain the multilateral resistance term for the exporter country, but uh, we don't have any variation for, apart from the time variation, for the importing country. And the opposite is true for the second specification when Argentina is an exporter. And we'll give you a, a, a on the robustness checks, we try to address uh, the possible uh, problem that, that, I mean, the possible way to overcome this problem, because the only way to uh, specify, I mean, to, uh, I mean, the only way to absorb uh, the, by the multilateral resistance term that, that characterizes Argentina in these two cases, this will be uh, all uh, included into, uh, say, the time variation here. So time variation is going to uh, obtain the, is going to uh, contain a lot of information here. Uh, so take the log of this specification and we obtain the model to estimate. Once again, two different uh, 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 models depending on whether Argentina is an importer or is an exporter, where uh, as you see here, uh, we have um, the, the logs are uh, in uh, small um, letter here um, and migration enters together with all the others uh, with the distance uh, with uh, absorption absorption capacity of the i country in case argentina is an exporter or uh, exporting capabilities of each one of the eight uh, european countries here um, now as you see here the um, country fixed effect in both cases is uh, um, actually taking care of the uh, multilateral resistance term, but only on the exporter side in the first specification and on the importer side in the second specification here. Now, <clears throat> we propose two uh, different uh, types of estimation of these two equations. The first estimation is to uh, basically consider uh, exports and imports all together. So having Argentina sometimes uh, on the importing side, some other times on the exporter side, and uh, uh, basically um, uh, estimating the whole model uh, all together here. Uh, now, the big advantage is that we can increase uh, the degrees of freedom in this case, since we, we can combine both exports and imports of Argentina during that period, uh, but uh, we lose the possible heterogeneity in the effects of migration that, for instance, you can see here through um, the um, delta imp and delta exp uh, coefficients that are pinpointed here. The second way we estimate this equation instead is to give two different estimations separating exports and imports or at the same time combining exports and imports together in order to obtain overall trade uh, of Argentina here. Um, uh, and here uh, once again the multilateral resistance terms problem that I was uh, pinpointing you and then we'll, we'll reappraise that um, in the last few slides. Um, now identification problem. I mentioned already has uh, mm, one of the more, most important uh, factors for Argentine immigration was the increase in the demand for labor due to the fact that there was an expansion uh, of, the, uh, of the, I mean, the, the arable land increased uh, and the abolition of slavery, as I mentioned before. 
So um, we can actually say, well, uh, migration increased simply uh, because exports increased. So the causality can, can go the other way around. Um, increase in exports may have caused, uh, I'll give you an example here, an increase the a, a labor demand, uh, and this has attracted migrants here. Um, so we have a problem of uh, um, uh, endogenous uh, endogeneity of the of the uh, of the migration variable, uh, which violates the orthogonality condition in the estimation. So what we do, um, we propose an IV instrument, and the IV instrument that we um, we propose is the following. It's an IV instrument, it's a variable that should uh, get um, or collect especially the pool factors um, from, uh, sorry, the, the, the push factors, uh, sorry for the, uh, the push factors from the all the I countries here. Uh, what we did, basically we got as an instrument all the migration to the US during the same period from the same partner countries here. So basically it's the migration to the US during that same period from the eight uh, European, actually six European countries since uh, 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 the breakdown of countries was different uh, with respect to the Argentine uh, data that we had at the beginning. Now, this is something that uh, someone who's familiar with the uh, trade literature is, uh, was uh, uh, used under, in a, un, under a different context by uh, David Authors and others um, in the AER paper in 2013, but as I said, on a, on, on a different uh, framework. Um, David Author and others were trying to instrument uh, uh, the US-China trade in that case, and what they did, it was to consider the uh, Chinese trade flows to all the other countries but the US uh, to instrument for the, uh, for the endogenous variables that they had there. And basically, uh, what we are doing, we are, this is exactly the same, but in the context of uh, migration, um, we, we think that this uh, um, um, variable is able to um, obtain, to, um, to characterize and to uh, absorb and to represent all the different push factors from the, from the European countries that we are considering in our, in our, uh, in our estimation here. Um, data. Um, well, some of the data uh, can be obtained very easily from the Tradist uh, um, data set. Um, from the CP, uh, they offer a, a great uh, data set for all countries in the world starting in the 1800. Um, but for Argentina, we prefer to use, or we actually refined our, um, our data with uh, some uh, uh, data that were not in, in that particular data set and that uh, Federico collected directly in Argentina or collected from some of the others like uh, Ferreras here. Um, by, especially bilateral migration was something not easily to obtain since uh, for trade data and GDP data, uh, Tradist is great, is the best data set that you can get, uh, but for um, migration flows uh, and especially migration flows uh, in a bilateral way, um, you have to resort to archives. And this is what uh, Federico did, uh, basically um, in the archives of the Banco Central de la Republica Argentina. Okay, I'm pretty, I'm able to uh, show you the first results. Um, okay, so these are the results for estimation one. Basically, when we consider Argentina once as a, an exporting country and some other times as an importing country. Um, as you see here, the number of observations increases quite a lot here. So we have about 500 observations due to the, the period that we are considering here. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, and uh, we can have an estimation of, uh, um, uh, say, um, GDP at the origin, GDP at destination, or 
this could be y and x, basically, the two variables that I showed you before, um, together with immigration flows. I mean, this is something that we can have because we are considering Argentina sometimes as an origin or some other times as a destination country. Um, now, the OLS estimation uh, uh, gives us a, a, um, estimates for GDP which are in line, uh, but and um, C distance is having the, the typical negative effect here. Um, uh, and we have different estimation depending on whether we include or exclude different fixed effects. Uh, year fixed effect or country pair fixed effect here. So if we look at the last column for the OLS and then for the IV, uh, we see that actually immigration flow uh, has a, a, a significant and, and positive effect here, uh, which is actually pretty high when we consider the IV uh, result here. Now, this is the estimation when considering, as I said, all together, so in this case, we cannot uncover uh, the differential effect of immigration flow uh, on separately on exports or imports. Uh, we have to resort to the other specification instead to estimation two um, in order to have a, a separating effect uh, between the exports and the imports. Um, now, and, and this is the table, uh, I hope you're able to see it, here, um, where um, we consider um, um, basically Argentina sometimes as an exporter, sometimes as an importer, or in, in the first four columns here, we summed up everything, uh, export plus imports, in order to get an effect on overall trade. Now, as you see here, um, once again, if we simply concentrate, on the last uh, uh, column, which includes all uh, the effects, um, we don't, I mean, the estimate is, is somewhat imprecise for overall trade, is somewhat imprecise, still positive, but imprecise for exports, as you see here, but is uh, strongly positive and uh, 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 significant for imports. Uh, and this, we think, it's a, a, a major important result for our uh, for our model here. Now, robustness checks. Um, now, all the data that we have considered here for immigration are migration flows, um, basically for limitation in the data, because uh, we only have uh, three. Uh, reliable data on migration stocks that will come from the three census uh, that were done in Argentina. Uh, uh, basically, through these census, uh, we can obtain bilateral migration stocks, uh, but three data uh, are too little for, for, for that. Uh, so we tried to proxy migration stocks, uh, since migration stocks are supposed to have a strong effect, uh, both on imports and exports. Um, and, and we do that basically by um, summing up all the flows, all the five years um, uh, flows, the five past years flows, in order to obtain a, 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 an approximation of the migration stocks. Now, um, during that period, this is a, a very rough approximation, as you can imagine, since during that period, there, were, there was a lot of immigration to, to Argentina, but a lot of out-migration at the same time. So um, it would certainly help to, to have net migration uh, uh, in, in, in this particular situation here. Um, uh, and then uh, I want to show you a, a possibility of to overcome the problem that I've been pointing you before, the fact that we only have uh, that we, we don't have basically the multilateral resistance ter terms on the Argentinian side um, because of the of the fact that we don't have a variation on the exporter or the importer side when Argentina is the exporter and the importer at the same time. Uh, and we use the Caliendo Parro uh, approach in order to do that. Okay, first. Uh, cumulated migration as a proxy for stocks. 
uh, here we simply consider the um, estimation when we consider exports and imports separately. Um, in this case, we lose some uh, observations since we have to accumulate some of the variables. But uh, as you, we see here, we have a, a, a pretty consistent result on imports, both uh, when we consider uh, the ILS estimation and the IV estimation here. And actually, pretty surprisingly, um, the um, coefficients for imports, when we consider the IV estimation, is not that different from uh, the coefficients that we got for uh, when we consider migration. Um, last, um, uh, how to overcome the problem of multilateral resistance term. And as, as we said, I mean, this is the um, most uh, uh, recent results that we got. We would like to share them with you and probably to open a discussion on that. So the problem here is to try to overcome the problem of not having a multilateral resistance terms on the Argentine side. Um, so as we said, uh, one possibility is to use the Caliendo Parro approach, which translated into our context means the following. Uh, basically, use a, a, consider a third country. In this case, we use Bolivia here. And consider for Bolivia the same bilateral um, uh, data that we obtained for all the other country pairs. So um, bilateral trade between Bolivia and each one of those countries that we consider here. Uh, so when Bolivia was a, an importer or when Bolivian was an exporter at the same time. Um, and uh, we would need also bilateral migration data for uh, Bolivia. Now, why we chose Bolivia? Basically because Bolivia was a very close country during that uh, uh, particular period and especially was a very close country for migration. So migration flows into Bolivia were very, very low, up to the point that we could probably consider uh, migration flows in and out of Bolivia as zeros here. Now, that's very useful because um, assume that we consider the same uh, augmented gravity model uh, that we um, considered before. This is in the general um, uh, in the general uh, um, framework that uh, is represented by Haddon Meyer, considering, as we said, uh, absorption approach, uh, absorption uh, capabilities M, and export as capability S, augmented since we want to include migration here. Okay. Now, although now we have uh, three countries and we can combine uh, the data for the three countries in the following way, by considering three ratios all together here in the way that we see here, uh, and by combining the three ratios in the way that we, we, we see here and considering that distance uh, works as a bilateral and symmetric um, uh, bilateral resistance cost, the bilateral resistance term here, uh, then the tribal ratio here uh, will reduce to uh, this relationship here, where the only um, data that will count in order to uh, explain or to represent this tribal ratio here are, say, the asymmetric uh, uh, bilateral resistance terms that you have here, uh, which include migration. But, as we said, uh, basically migration in and out of Bolivia were zeros. So this term, this term, uh, and this term, and this term disappear. At the same time, uh, migration uh, out of Argentina into the European countries is zero, as we said, since uh, migration was only one way from Argentina from European countries to Argentina. So the only uh, uh, factor that remains within this ratio here is the first term here, okay? Uh, take the log uh, and um, 
by considering psi as the uh, log uh, of the triple ratio that we have here, uh, we can explain this simply uh, as depending on migration between Argentina and all the European countries. So the, the, the variable that we had before, uh, plus fixed effects. So let me show you the results that we got here. These are only OLS results uh, for the triple ratio. Some of the results are um, interesting. I mean, um, some others are, are less. I mean, the, the first good news is that immigration here still has a positive effect. Uh, although, as we see very imprecise when we include the country fixed effect and a time trend, we didn't want to include year fixed effects here uh, since otherwise the degrees of freedom will decrease too much. Um, uh, but as we see here, we still have a positive effect um, for the whole sample here. And when we reduce the sample to the last, uh, uh, say, 24 years for all the countries, we still have a positive effect. But um, once again, only when we include the country fixed effect here. Um, so uh, I'm about to conclude. Um, basically, I hope I convinced you that uh, uh, migration was had a very positive effect on uh, um, the performances, the Argentine performances in trade between 1870 and 1913. Uh, and especially that the main channel through which migration had a positive effect was imports. And indeed, what we have in mind now is try to investigate further um, this channel, the import channel, uh, basically considering uh, what I mentioned to you as a sort of olive oil effect or wine effect. Uh, the idea is that uh, the preference channel here expanded the, the, the number of varieties that uh, characterize the Argentine economy. So, uh, the widening of the export varieties that were available to Argentine consumers uh, were, could count uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a good way for the whole economy. Uh, and uh, if we take the uh, typical measures uh, of gains from trade that have been put forward, for instance, by, by Bob Fenstra in a recent paper, considering product varieties and the increase in product varieties as a, as a measure or as a, an important contribution to the gains from trade and having a, an elasticity that we could uh, uh, um, compute, uh, that we have computed through this uh, um, model here, uh, we can obtain a measure of gains from trade here. I'm done, thank you. Okay, Giuseppe, thank you very much for your very clear presentation and, and such an interesting topic. I think that uh, Rama has been quite busy today to answer different questions raised in, in the chat. Perhaps there are some issues that uh, our uh, attendants have been asking to the chat and perhaps they still have doubts that, that we'd like to also uh, share with you. So I will now open a, a turn of intervention. So just yes, feel free to intervene. Uh, Antonio, I think that you would like to say something. Uh, yes, um, hi, thanks a lot for this uh, nice presentation. It has been a pleasure to listen and, uh, you know, follow uh, your slides. Uh, and uh, the paper was very interesting. And I have to recognize that I'm very uh, not very familiar with uh, uh, trade uh, models. But just I would like to ask you um, about, so how can you justify the difference between uh, in your main uh, uh, table how can you justify the, 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 the big jump by, uh, I don't know, uh, some thousand percent of between the OLS coefficient and uh, the ID coefficient? Okay. There is basically one digit more. And uh, my main doubt is about uh, um, the strong reduction of the coefficient of the GDP of the origin count. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if there is, there could be some issue with the instrument that uh, explains uh, these uh, changes between uh, uh, OLS and IV. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll let Rama uh, say something. She wants to say that too. Um, yeah, I mean, Rama is suggesting measurement errors. Uh, it could be one one question, but certainly, I mean, you're right. I mean, we have a big jump when we include um, the when we consider the um, say the the year, uh, basically the. Um, um, well, I mean, you can see here that also the, I mean, the, we have a prob problem. I mean, we have a, a, a big change in the second and the fourth column in the ID estimation, uh, meaning when we basically um, include um, the, the, the time variation, the year fixed effect. Um, so probably it's something that we should uh, consider there, something that we don't have, for instance, in the OLS uh, estimation here. Um, uh, certainly this has something to do with the, with the, the, the type of um, instrumental variable that we have. Um, now, uh, the instrumental variable uh, is, uh, is doing pretty a good job uh, in terms of the, the first stage, if I recall well, and Rama can confirm, um, so certainly it's something related to uh, the year fixed effect uh, that is uh, giving, a, 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 is changing uh, partly the, the estimation that we have here. But uh, yeah, certainly Antonio is something that we have to look through. Um, unfortunately, uh, as you can imagine, uh, dealing with historical data, um, give you a lot of excitement, but at the same time, very little data and very fewer data that, that you can have uh, with, uh, um, I mean, uh, say, um, modern times or current times. I see. Thanks for the answer. I, I think that, uh, well, of course, it's uh, um, not so easy to work with uh, uh, data from that period. Perhaps maybe one, uh, one idea to you know understand if there is an issue is to think about the possibility that if uh, migration towards the US affects the US economy and the US economy somehow affects what happens in Argentina, this could like uh, violate the, the, the conditions of, uh, of independence and exclusion restrictions. But again, I, 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 I mean, I don't know, I cannot see much further because it's very far away from from what I usually do. But anyway, thanks a lot. No, no, that's uh, that. Uh, I mean, that's right. I mean, what we should do um, is to see what. I mean, th th first consider that this is only contemporaneous, so we should have a contemporaneous effect at the same time of um, migration uh, to the U.S. increasing trade. Um, between US and Argentina, and so increasing Argentinian trade. Um, certainly, this is something that we can look through. Um, consider that at the beginning, we, we, we started considering another country as a, as a country uh, to, from which to, to, to get the, um, uh, the, 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 the migration flows um, uh, in order to obtain the IV instrument that I showed you before. And this was Brazil. Um, and, and with Brazil, certainly we had that problem. We got the US because, well, we have to look into the data, but certainly this is something that we can put in the paper, um, which, by the way, is almost ready. So I can share it with you probably in the next couple of days. Um, um, and, and it's un certainly something that we can, can put there. Even though um, this uh, does not seem to answer um, the question, um, I mean, why the second and the fourth column uh, is uh, so different with respect to the first and the third in the IV estimation, unless this is taken care by the year fixed effect. Okay, thanks, Antonio, anyway. Thanks, thanks a lot for the, for the clarification. Thank you. Rama, I don't know if you wanted to, to, to say something. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, there has been a uh, couple I, of... I, I, yes, please, I, I, go ahead. 
Uh, yes, I had some difficulties in unmuting me. Uh, no, I don't have nothing to uh, to add to your presentation. Actually, I miss uh, I miss some questions in the in the chat, uh, and uh, now I'm not able to go back to all the questions, and I'm sorry for that. So, yeah. if there's something that I uh, that that I didn't uh, answer, and you want to uh, ask again, I'm I'm here now. I think that, that there were a couple of questions related to, to how you have measured distance and how you could introduce a measure that is much more sensitive to the evolution of costs and, and also trade tariffs, no? in the sense that there could be changes also in, in trade policies during that period. I don't know if you want to add something on that. Uh, I mean, um, okay. Rama, you transportation go. costs uh, uh, changes uh, along with, uh, with time. And that's why we include the year fixed effect. We try some specification with transportation cost, but as I wrote in the chat, uh, those data are not country specific, so changes in the in the same way for all the for all the countries that we consider. And that's why we prefer to include only the year fixed effect because they can capture exactly uh, the changes in uh, um, the change in transportation costs uh, during uh, during the time that we con that we consider um, for uh, uh, tariff uh, we uh, we uh, did the robustness checks uh, with the third country effect that should be ca that should uh, capture for um, for a, a trade policy. Uh, of all the countries in the sample, so Argentina and the trade partner. Uh, but I was answering to the chat and I didn't uh, see if uh, Giuseppe presented the, the, the robustness check. No, I didn't, I didn't present. I mean, did, we had data on uh, transport, I mean, more than transportation costs, we had data on tariffs because uh, some of the tariffs are bilateral. The problem is that in the trade is the data set. Yes, there are a lot of yeah, missing data. Yeah, there are, I mean, bilateral tariffs are pretty rare. And here mm -hmm. we are really looking at the bilateral um, relationship here. Uh, so um, um, this was the main, the main limitation from, from the data that, that we had. We tried, but we lose a lot of information um as also in the in, in the last robustness check um the the caliendo parro approach with the triple ratio approach um i mean it would be would have been nice to have uh, also uh tariffs because this is another um say asymmetric uh, uh, bilateral resistance term that you would like to include certainly i mean we in the first version of our model, we included that, but when we tried, uh, we lost so much information since we didn't have bilateral tariffs uh, that it was impossible to, to, to present those data. So everything is, uh, is put into the, say, uh, country fixed effect and, the, and the, well, in that case, it was the time trend or the time fixed effect. There was one intervention in the chat by uh, Joseph Luis Carrion, who was arguing that uh, looking at the figures and, and the results, perhaps there will be the, the possibility of some structural change or the possibility of just estimating the model by superiors, just trying to see if uh, the effect of, of migration was different at the beginning, probably when you start creating trade networks, than when the network is consolidated and then there are other types of factors that matter. Can you please expand a, a bit more on that? Yeah, I think we, um, I didn't present the data here, but we, we have we have separated the period between before 1890 and after 1890, especially because 1890 was an important uh, uh, date since uh, there was a, a bearing crisis. Uh, uh, so it was a, a big financial crisis, even though uh, it was especially, let me show you the picture actually. Uh, do you still see my slides? Yes, we see. Ah, okay, that. okay. Actually, I don't know how to get out now. So <laughs> <it's> like... <laughs> um... Okay, well, I didn't present you this uh, slide here, 
which tells you the relationship uh, between uh, uh, Spanish uh, um, and Italian immigration and the real wage premia here. Um, I mean, this can give you a, a, a good picture. Probably it's better if I... Probably you see it much better in this way. Uh, as you see here, 1890, 1891 is an important uh, uh, breakthrough period. Even though uh, you don't see a, a, a big change in the trend of, my, of migration. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean, there was a, a big peak up in the, in, in the very last part, but we only have very few years. Um, and, and what is strange is that this peak up was uh, uh, not before not because the, 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 the real wage premium was increasing, because the, the, the major increase in the real wage premium uh, for the Argentine economy was in, in, in the first years here. Um, uh, so certainly there are other factors that played an important role here, like network factors, uh, for instance, here. But um, to come back to the suggestion, basically, um, we have, uh, I didn't present it, um, but we have uh, uh, estimation for the two different sub-periods. And if I recall well, there aren't uh, differences, but, but it's something we can, uh, we can, we can leave in the paper if, uh, if, if, if especially economic historians think it's, uh, it's an interesting um, uh, matter to, 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 to tackle. Do you recall Rama or, or Federico? No, I don't recall. I don't remember, Rolanda. sorry. No. Okay. Uh, any additional questions? Okay, so if there are not, I would like to thank again uh, the speakers. Uh, thank you also to, to all the attendants. Uh, I think that the session was, has been very fruitful, very interesting paper, very interesting comments. And we hope to see you soon in a future seminar. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.